talks and listen to Navy leaders and, and, and chart out our future. Um, what a great, great opportunity. I want to welcome all of our, all of our guests, all of our AUSS members, uh, everybody from the midshipmen in the back to the, to the senior admiral in the, in the crowd, and I won't try and pick out who that is. Um, but a few special people I want to recognize. Um, Admiral Lair, thanks for taking time out of your day to come, come be part of this. And uh, you're, you're the one who attracted all this audience, so uh, we're waiting, waiting to hear what you have to say. Uh, Chuck Corday from Khaki, one of our uh, sponsors. Um, your Admiral Sam Bozen, uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, let's see Tom Crabtree and Bob Noonan from Booz Allen. Thank you. Tom, where are you? Oh, okay. I didn't think I'd see him. Okay. And uh, see, Rear Admiral Steve Israel, the chairman of uh, AUSM Board of Directors. Um, Rear Admiral Brian Cutchin, thanks for taking time out of your day. And uh, Captain Bernie Upchurch, you're a staunch supporter of our organization, so thank you. Everything everything we do, you're, you're a part of. So thanks. Okay, like I said, this is a uh, tremendous opportunity for business leaders and Navy leaders to get together in kind of an informal, op an informal setting and talk about what each are thinking about, looking, looking forward to the future, sharing ideas. Um, past guest speakers have included Vice Admiral Al Myers, uh, Commander of Naval Air Forces, and uh, most recently Admiral Greenert when he was the uh, Vice Chief of Naval Operations. Um, today, we're very, very honored to have Admiral Lair come talk to us. Admiral Lair is a uh, graduate of the University of Southern Maine, so you're a Mainer, I, I guess so. <laughs> uh, uh, got his commission through Officer Candidate School. Um, I think you were in the class with my wife as a manager. So I might have to ask you for some stories later. <laughs> um, and also a graduate of Naval War College. Um, He's a fleet communications officer in the surface warfare community before he switched over to cryptology and eventually getting his, uh, his uh, earning, earning your uh, information dominance qualifications. As a flag officer, Admiral Laird has served as the director of information operations on the CNO staff. He's also served as the deputy commander of U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, and I think you were part of the stand-up crew for that. Uh, I can imagine that was an interesting time in your life. And now you're the Director of Program Integration for Information Dominance. And with that, Bill, please, please uh, come up. I was remiss. I forgot to recognize a couple of, uh, uh, one person in particular, Vet Jobs. Vet Jobs is one of our sponsors for this. And uh, Ted Daywalt, thank you so much for all you do for us. Good afternoon, and thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I think uh, in the conversation, uh, what's on your mind is what's on my mind, and it's uh, local politics of the next uh, seven days or so is probably going to uh, shape uh, my Thanksgiving dinner and, and, and maybe some of yours as well. Uh, I'm sticking to my story that DNS has given us next Wednesday afternoon off, and, and uh, that's what I plan on doing, but uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I've, uh, you, you know, getting recognized and or introduced like this, it gives you some time to think about, you know, where you've been in this journey uh, through our career. And, and I really have spent, except for the time that I was a student at the Naval uh, War College, all of my time working in Naval Communications in one way or another. And I, I uh, kind of include my SIGINT cred within communications because if it's not our communications, it might have been someone else's, but I think that's one of the hallmarks of really why uh, cyberspace is a little bit different, is, is we operate cyberspace in, in really uh, a couple of uh, different dimensions, uh, friendly cyberspace and foreign cyberspace. So it's a lot like uh, any, uh, anything else that we, uh, we plan on in, in water space management or air space management. There's always a foe there that we've got to think about, and cyberspace is no different. Yeah, so I really will focus a little bit about what cyberspace is to me and, and, and a little bit about uh, how I think that's going to shape things programmatically for N2 and 6 as, as we go forward. Um, you know, this 
ubiquitous word that probably came into our vernacular about three and a half or four years ago of cyber. I mean, we didn't even say the whole thing. We, we just said cyber. We didn't say cyberspace. And then it became a domain that was recognized in, uh, in, in joint language uh, with its own joint pub uh, zero definition. And, and it basically says the things that are connected uh, to the network and, and the real difference is, is when you start to look at that, is it meet the, the basic test in the Clausewitzian way, can you, can you have war there? And I think we, we see this, and we've seen it certainly uh, in foreign uh, settings with, with uh, Russia and Estonia to an extent, uh, to, to Russia and Georgia probably to a greater extent. We see it domestically, I think, with Aurora uh, in uh, what uh, Google and, and about 20 other companies experienced a couple of years ago. And, and so uh, if you can press the believe button that in cyberspace you can have an extension of war by other means, then I think it makes the test for domain and, and think uh, about what it means to fight there and start to organize there the same way that we work in the other domains. I think, you know, every place that we've been in the last 15 years or so from the time that we really started using networks somewhat ubiquitously, it was really just after the Desert Storm time frame in the Navy uh, it it kind of grew up with, with things built on top of each other, and that's the challenge that we have now, is to rationalize this, put it into a, a command and control framework that's going to make uh, sense to other commanders that we've got to interface with, but also have that promise that cyberspace offers that we really can uh, produce meaningful effects, whether offensive effects or defensive effects. But there is one difference, I think, that is... Uh, you know, fairly uh, significant and, and causes you to think a little bit differently about the effects that you have. And it's, it's the customizability of things that are happening in cyberspace. You know, uh, all of you probably have a smartphone or a smart device of some sort uh, within arm's reach right now. Uh, and if you contrast the things that can be built for that in really a matter of hours to the communication systems that were available to me with, as a junior officer, there's a world of difference. You can get back into this, this ability to write code on the fly that will do something, either provide your capability, provide you a way to get into someone else's network. And so that customizability is the, the piece that I think sets it apart from the other domains that we have. So when we work through at, at Tenth Fleet in particular, getting that operational model uh, for cyberspace as a domain, uh, I think you looked at uh, first overcoming something that that cyberspace gets a little bit of a criticism for. Well, it's a man-made domain, and and the other domains uh, happen naturally around us. Well, uh, the sea isn't so good unless you put an aircraft carrier or destroyer or an LCS there. Uh, air power doesn't happen without without tomahawks and hornets and and joint strike fighters. So there's a there's a dynamic that balances, I believe think about cyberspace, that happens really because we've applied human technology uh, to physics uh, that happens in that naturally in the electromagnetic spectrum. And that leads us, I think, to the other piece of cyberspace is now we're seeing a lot of convergence because that same handheld device that's very flexible allows you to enter cyberspace from almost any place on, on the planet. And so that's the piece that, the, that really is the the challenge for me right now is to secure that uh, so we can use these smart devices in our environment, but also uh, uh, look for ways to attack that uh, in, a, in, a, in a continual way. Um, the, the thoughts about uh, what you have to do in cyberspace, I think, also parallel where we are in uh, thinking about uh, superiority or, or uh, our ability to operate with impunity in the other domain. So uh, we talk about uh, having a, you know, control of the seas, control of the skies, and, and I think those pieces uh, uh, port over to how you think about cyberspace operations uh, in a pretty uh, direct way. Uh, I would suggest that uh, I have to uh, provide naval forces you know, three basic capabilities. The first is to assure their ability to command and control. Uh, there's literally nothing that the Navy uh, has invested in that doesn't depend on our networks in one way or another for us to operate. 
Uh, but that will come later. The ability to exchange orders, the ability to uh, target launch strikes and assess the, re the results of those strikes is something that every strike group has to do in every day. So there's got to be this idea that, that uh, I like the way that Admiral Willard talks about it, thin line command control so you know what you have to do at any given time. So that's, I think, the first job that we've got to do. We've got to understand what that thin line is and make sure that we can assure that 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for strike groups. Because without that, we cannot operate effectively as part of the force. The second is what I would say freedom of navigation in cyberspace. Freedom of navigation means to use all those other things that we've invested in. And it goes uh, to a wide variety of capabilities. It goes from uh, virtually all of our logistics reach back via networks to be able to do that. Uh, the, you, you're not going to stop a Hornet from flying, but Air Forces will tell you that uh, we can fly a Hornet much more effectively if you can reach back to Boeing on a daily basis to exchange data about how it flew the day before. Uh, all of our uh, welfare and rec things now are, are dependent on cyberspace. I remember waiting in line at a phone exchange in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, we don't wait in line for uh, that anymore. We've got you know, sailor phones to, uh, to the ship. So it, it's a big part of a welfare bank. And then the things that, that really uh, you, you worry about, but uh, just come from uh, the view uh, debrief that just returned uh, telemedicine. And you get the, you get the, uh, the opportunity for a doctor who was on uh, USS Comstock that didn't have a, sorry, Green Bay, that didn't have a surgeon on board, but needed to do an appendectomy. I want that doc to have telemedicine available to them. I think you can all appreciate that. So, so that, uh, that I think puts the model of, of where we need to be on, on a sliding scale basis. We talk about cyberspace superiority. I don't think it's possible to have all the time any more than air supremacy is possible to have every, uh, all the time. But, but we've got to have a model that works within our uh, command and control uh, uh, model that, that every uh, other Navy component commander will understand. Um, I think uh, when you look across cyberspace, there are a couple of things that uh, uh, make it a little bit unique. Uh, the first is that we attack and defend on exactly the same platform that our adversaries attack and defend on. The internet is the internet. So whether it is you know, reaching out through uh, a uh, non-attributable network to get someplace in, in foreign cyberspace, well, guess what? That's how the adversary gets to you, too. And uh, so it is one big network. So the closest analogy that I know of in, in our normal uh, naval operating things is, is how a submariner looks at life. That uh, you've got a sonar and you've got that ability to look there, but, but it's really the same environment that, that a closing submarine will have. Um, that makes the problem of threat characterization and specifically attribution uh, very difficult. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're having a, a little bit of a difficult time pushing the boundaries of where we're comfortable from a policy and an ROE perspective uh, when it comes to cyberspace. Uh, very, very easy in the physical world, the platform world, uh, to attribute attack uh, you, you know, with our, our vast uh, ISR capabilities from, from both organic and, and national means. Uh, you can see a launch from almost any place on the earth, and, and you can detect the presence of physical forces, and you can uh, get a, uh, a bunch of evidence that leads you back to a smoking gun. Uh, harder to do in cyberspace, and I think because of that, that's caused our, our policy uh, guys and, and, and the people on the civilian leadership side to, to take a deep breath every time that we bring a cyber capability to look at and say, you know, do you want to execute this option? Thus far, there really hasn't been a lot of comfort in doing that. Uh, one, because of attribution, and two, because we don't really have a good sense yet of unintended consequences of the use of uh, cyber capabilities offensively in the wild. You, you think you do, you model it, you, you bring it onto a test range, but, but it's going to perform exactly like that in the wild. I think there's that uh, that bit of doubt. I think the other thing that sets uh, cyberspace apart from the platform world that I grew up in is that uh, industry uh, drives this domain more than the uh, platform domains. 